Good evening. Good evening, sir. Not tired? No, sir. Very good. That is the way we say in Sri Balaji Society. This evening, it is my proud privilege to welcome a person who really needs no introduction. It is the former Air Chief who led the air attack during the Kargil War himself. As Air Chief, nobody goes in. <laughs> Initially, he flew the then frontline fighter aircraft, that is the Hunters. He himself is an ace MiG pilot. He is a pioneer in MiG-21s and has converted six squadrons to MiG-21 supersonic aircraft. I hope you understand what is supersonic. An aircraft which flies faster than sound. In 1965 war, he provided air cover to our bases and also did offensive sweeps over Pakistan. The PAF, that is the Pakistani Air Force, always stayed clear of his sweeps because they knew who the pilot was in that aircraft. <laughs> he retired in 2001, but before retirement, he said, I must have a last solo flight. And that flight was in the aircraft which has been his first love, that is MiG-21. That, friends, is the Air Chief Marshal while he was in service. Post-retirement, a person like him does not sit idle. Initially, for the first five to ten years, he said, I'm going to travel. He traveled in India, traveled abroad, saw the world with different viewpoint this time. He has been president of the Air Force Association, vice president of the Sarvodaya movement. He gives quite a few lectures and we are grateful to him for having come here to us also to talk to us. He is a panelist on many TV programs, you must have seen him, a writer and an honorary advisor to educational institutions. Please remember, friends, that he has done all this not alone. No. No man, no one man can do all alone. Standing with and behind him has always been the gracious lady, Mrs. Molina Tipnis, who is here with us this evening. <laughs> Molina, ma'am, has been president of the Air Force Wives Welfare Association. She is an accomplished artist, an interior decorator, and above all, a dietitian as well as a chef. Now we know the secret of the slimness of the Air Chief Marshal. <laughs> Friends, I can go on and on for tipness, sir, but the day is his. Sir, may we now request you to come and enlighten us and give some tips to our young people as to what you are, who you are, and how you did it all. Over to Air Chief Marshal Tipness. Thank you, friends. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Dr. Subramanian, Brigadier Bambani, my friend of many years and many adventures, Major Arun Fatak, members of the faculty, student body, Ladies and gentlemen of the student body, it's a great pleasure to be here. You know, I was amazed when Brigadi Bambani once told me that, okay, we are having this lecture on a Sunday. I said, Sunday? Hey, Sunday is, don't you have a holiday? And I said, what's a holiday? <laughs> yeah, you guys don't know what a holiday is. I think you've all forgotten. 
and then he tells me it will be from 6.30 to 8. Now you got to be some sort of a lunatic, you know, to be working on a Sunday, late in the evening. I think I could suggest a few more interesting things to do. But he said, no, that's our culture, and I salute you for it. It's extraordinarily, your dedication to this. Because let me tell you this, however good you may be, without perspiration, there is no result. And sacrifice is an essential part of life. But then I said, I need to be a little more kind to all of you than uh, that the advisor. And I said, okay, I'm not going to give a presentation. None of those, uh, you know, with these, all these uh, modern gadgets. I'm not here to give, deliver any oration, nor a speech. I thought I would be here on a conversation, and that's exactly what I'm doing. The intention is to talk to you, share some of my experiences, which I hope will be relevant to you, not only in whatever line you choose after this, but in facing life itself. And therefore, the theme of my conversation this evening is management of ourselves. You're all management students. Management of ourselves as a nation, as a society, as individuals. And this management I'm going to cover in not any sequential manner, but in a broad broadband coverage. Talking about coping with the situation as it exists on ground today. And talk about reaching to the future. How we are going to how we should prepare, in fact, not only prepare, but shape the future. Mark the words, shape. Now, when this invitation I got, actually, I was surprised that when you say management, what has the military got in common with management? Let me tell you, the discipline of management is actually something that has been created by the military. People tend to think that military and fighting wars and battles is a question of firing guns, courage and bravery. Of course that is required. But courage and bravery are not the basis on which we plan wars. It is an extra over and above, but management is the essence of military. To have aims and objectives, what is it that we want to do? And you'll find the, the military bases its war planning on what we call as principles of war. There are 10, I think now they have added a couple of more, on which you do your planning. And you will find that these principles are very similar to those that you have as management principles. Very, very similar. And the essential thing of fighting wars is management. Management of resource. How much? What type? Where? When? And doing it in a fashion in which your adversary and which in the industry and business are your competitors, if you want to get the better of them, you have to be two steps ahead. And that is exactly what happens in the military. Things change, as you find the rate at which changes are taking place that rate itself is in fact accelerating. Changes are not taking place at the same rate. As you know that, I don't know whether some of you have read 
an author called Alvin Toffler. Alvin Toffler, what, what we call as a futurologist. What is a futurologist? Is anyone aware of this? Anyone, any hand ups at all? I thought so. I did a Google search to find out are there any institutions at all in India which have a undergraduate or a postgraduate course in futurology? One, one institution, <laughs> but I couldn't get the name. So I don't know whether it is correct, and it says in Tamil Nadu. But I asked for which is the institution, there was no input on that. So I have a feeling that it was attempted, but in fact, it was an abortive attempt. Now, in a land of people who believe in astrology, hey, what's the future? I'm sure many of you have gone, had somebody read your palm, somebody had their stars read, you know, had your, what do you call this, Janam Patrika, to say what lies in future for you. Futurologists are not like that. They are not talking in terms of making wild guesses of what will be. They, in fact, talk in terms of the basis of which technology is developing, the basis on which society is developing, what lies in the future. And Toffler's thesis is, he died uh, just a few years ago, and Toffler's thesis is that civilizations grow in waves. And I don't know if you're aware, do you know what the modern times, in fact, he refers to as? As the third wave. The first wave is the agrarian wave. And this was just past the Neolithic times. Which means you talk in terms of the Stone Age when human beings, the Homo sapiens, actually started converting stones and wood into implements to help them do their jobs better. And then, about 10,000 years ago, came the first wave, and that is when man took up agriculture. And then after that, which was the next wave, in the 19th century, after all these years, came the Industrial Revolution. When Europe found the power of steam and mechanical contraptions started being constructed. And it changed the whole society. And what happened? That until the Industrial Revolution came, The rich countries, as compared to the poor countries, were just about two or three times as rich. But after the Industrial Revolution, in fact, the rate of growth of wealth just accelerated. And you found that these rich countries, or which were in the second wave, the Industrial Revolution, now they started doubling their own incomes every 20 or 30 years. And therefore you find the disparity between the second wave, the Industrial Revolution, and the first wave, which is still the agricultural-based economy, suddenly Went, went many, many times over. And now what you hope to be in, and which is a peripheral as far as India is concerned, is the third wave, in which knowledge will drive wealth, it will drive the economy, and it will decide which society goes ahead. Now, many of these 
you need to know this because in India today, I call it that we have four strata of civilization. There is globally three strata. You have what is known as the agrarian society, one who are doing farming, the industrial society, essentially. I mean, it's not compartmentalized. And then you have the knowledge society, people with, you know, information technology, your inter uh, internet, cell telephones, and the lot. That is the third. And in India today, in fact, we have four strata of society. And when we talked in terms of globalization, people said the world will come together. And in fact, the result was what people called in terms as global, not only globalization, but a clash of civilizations. Now, some part of these intellectuals, forward-looking intellectuals, thought in terms of that this is essentially this class of civilizations is essentially based on clash of religions. And what they think is that, you know, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and it is on this basis. In fact, there is a school of thought led by Toffler and others who said this clash of civilizations is based on economy. And therefore, in India today, what we need to talk why are there is so much of discord? Why is this fighting amongst ourselves? Why is it that we seem to be angry all the time? It is not so much based on where you come from. And in fact, uh, my ADC, Amit, you know, I was asking him as we are traveling, he says, Amit, where do you come from? So he said, Belgaum. And you know where Belgaum is. So I said, are you a Maharashtrian or are you a Kannada? And he gave me a very smart answer. What do you think he said? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is why I'm telling you all this is that we need to understand why this is the way it is. Because what we think the cause is, is actually not the cause. Now, what is the relation between this and the military? The military, in fact, because of its culture, is over, able to overcome this. Hierarchy, you know, different denominations of your faith, that's a private work. But when somebody prays, whether he goes to a mosque, whether he goes to a temple, or whether he goes to a gurdwara, or any other place, the commanding officer and other officers will go to that place. There is no differentiation. Even your living conditions, the way you do, what you do in the field, will be exactly the same. There will not be any differentiation. And this is what we learn to learn. So what are the other difficulties within our society as a nation, as a society, as individuals? It's now 60 years from the time that I was sitting where you are sitting now, just across at the National Defense Academy, and probably even more wide-eyed at what is happening before us. You know, it's uh, not even 10 years since independence. India was, you know, full of enthusiasm. We saw nothing but silver linings. Till today, India has made enormous, enormous progress. Yet, what are the things that we are focusing on? We are focusing more on what we are not doing. 
and the negative aspects of life than the positive aspects. And therefore I would tell you that I said first of all inspiration. The other is you must be optimistic. What are the things that one does, and I hope you do too, you tend to see what is it that societies who seem to have done as well as they have, what is it that they had? And if you go back to, you know, probably a few thousand years ago, India had some fantastic intellectuals in every possible field. Yet somewhere along the line, things were haywire. And a society which is most progressive today, at least has been for the last 50 or 60 years, is the United States of America. And one always says, what is it that they had? Do we have some of those qualities or we don't have some of those qualities? America, as you know, is a pioneer country. The American as such, the Anglo-Saxon American, the white American, as you might say, of course, there are the blacks now. But who actually came to the United States were pioneers. France was always looked upon as a country of land. You know, they had different lands, they had different cultures. England looked at itself as a people. That certain qualities that they felt were better or superior to anybody else. Give them the toughest task and the Brits will beat them all. The Americans thought of themselves as an idea. They were pioneers. They didn't want to be following somebody else. They wanted to set the trend. They always wanted to be the first. Are we wanting to do this? And one of the things one finds is, you know, your businesses, companies, trademarks telling you, hey, come to us. We have the best Japanese technology. We have the best from America. We have the best from France or wherever it is. Nobody says it's from India. Unless you have that feeling, a nationalistic feeling, that even if I don't have the best, I will take what is mine. Now look at it, you've seen the last few days, I don't know how much of time you get in your busy times to follow the news. See what is happening at that tri-junction where three borders meet, Bhutan, India and China. A situation very, very similar to what happened in 1962 when Aksai Chin and what Arunachal Pradesh, what was then known as the Northeast Frontier Agency. Same issues are there. This is the reality. Here is that soldier. On the other hand, the Chinese goods are flooding our markets. We are buying Chinese shoes, we are buying Chinese clothes, we are buying Chinese gizmos because they are cheaper. Now, the country must not stop this because it goes against the creed of globalization, open markets, free markets. But you and I, who have, you know, who have the beneficence of our nation at heart, can we not leave aside this? India, probably today, is in probably one of the most precarious conditions, but we are so used to it, we take it as second nature. Now, one of the reasons I believe that we have not attained our potential 
you know, we got independence in 47. China, in fact, liberated itself in 1949, after us. Yet why is it that they have gone way ahead and we have not? One would say that they talk in terms of the forms of government we have. Possibly it is so. And in fact, as I talked in terms of this futurologist, Alvin Toffler, he was asked when uh, he came to India, very, very late, uh, he says, does democracy is the form of government that will get us out of the state that we are in today. And his belief is, he says, no way, you have to change. And he says, no, don't worry, I say the same thing for the United States. He says, the way you are, if the United States continues to be the way you are, unless you change, it doesn't mean that radical that you go to a dictatorship, but you have to change. If you don't change, things will not change. And the same thing happens with people. Unless we change, I talked in terms of that we as a nation, as a society, have to change. But we also, as individuals, we have to change. One of the things that uh, I saw from Brigadier Bambani when he invited me here was the, this society, all the four institutions. Your principles or guiding focus on three qualities. Discipline, dedication, There you are. You have to have that. And uh, Dr. Subramaniam, he was uh, introducing me to his vision. Because this society, all of you are here because of his, his vision. And he told me, you know, what is it that he wants to do? And he says that I want to make sure that people go from here are a different class. Not only in their professional outlook, but in their personal character. In the traits that they have. And we, as a society, have to change. We come across as a very unruly people. We are angry. We are angry with each other. So one asks, why are we so angry? And the reason for that is that the way we have developed, that we have, the way we have managed ourselves, and that is, I said, what I am talking in terms of today, managing ourselves. In our management of ourselves, I think there have been a few deficiencies, despite all the progress that we have made. Unless our civic services go a totally metamorphosis, we cannot change. Whether you talk in terms of your communications, your transport communications, Electricity, water, drainage, sanitation, they are all below par. And therefore you find that there is always a competition, in fact a race, a merciless race to be ahead of the other guy. And therefore there is no empathy amongst ourselves as human beings, as Indians. I don't know whether you read, uh, there's an old writer, he's no more, Neerasi Choudhury. He wrote a book many, many years ago, a few decades ago, Why I Hate Indians. Now he was not writing in a way, in a bitter way, but he was trying to do an introspection. 
to see what is it that I need to do to change. And we found that our qualities, our civic sense, is so poorly developed. And one of the reasons for that is, I believe it starts in the family. How much we teach our children what to do, what is right, what is wrong, how to behave, how to speak. In our schools, in higher uh, institutions of education, in our workplaces, everywhere there is a code of conduct. And we have not laid down this code of conduct. And the military laid an enormous, enormous importance to this aspect. And there could be nothing worse to make us worse than watching, watching what? Our media, our electronic media. With the discussions, if that is a word that one can use, that take place on television. I don't call them discussions at all. I call them fish market squabbles. It is uncivilized. Nothing comes out of it. Today, I don't know, you people probably don't get the time. What is it that we look at television only as, of course you must look at it, television and entertainment. There are so many things happening. But it is also a source of gaining knowledge. Just watch the difference between Indian channels, news channels, how they discuss things, issues, and how the foreign channels do, because there are lots of foreign channels today. There is British, there is American, there is Australian, there is even this uh, Al Jazeera, and a whole lot of them. And see the way they conduct this. There are 10 people talking, I don't know, in that panel, when there are 10, 15 people talking, how can you listen to anybody? How can anybody get his point of view across? And the same thing happens here. The basic civic requirements of a society we have not developed. We don't know what a queue is. We are all pushing each other. Whether you go to a railway station, where you go to a bus stand, we are just pushing each other. 60 years ago, when I learned to drive, and I got my license, the first thing I had to do was to pass the ground examination. I had to know what the rules of the road are. I can tell you this, not one, I'm taking this as a challenge, not one of you knows the rules of the road, because you have not been taught. And the day after I got my license, I was uh, in Bangalore. I don't know how much of you are aware of the geography of Bangalore. I was coming up Brigade Road, there's a Mahatma Gandhi Road. There's a stop sign. I slowed down, I looked around, totally bereft of any traffic. I slowed down, dead slow, and I crossed. There was a whistle. I looked around, there was a copper there. He came. I am an 18-year-old boy. He came, saluted to me. A senior guy, he must have been at least in his 30s. He was a well dark. He says, good morning, sir. I'm 18 years old. He's twice my age. Sir, you didn't stop. I said, yes, but there's no traffic. He said, but the sign is there. Stop. That's it. He said, I have your license. He looked at my license. He said, you got it yesterday. <laughs> sir, you can't do this. And he said, sir, driving is just not being in the wheel. You have a responsibility to the other people who are using that road. And today, let me tell you this, nobody exercises that responsibility in India. As a uh, you were probably told during my introduction 
that I was in France for some years. <laughs> and I went to an airfield, you know, during my interaction. Uh, and there was this, we were driving on the taxi track. There are parts of the taxi, taxi tracks of where you know, aircraft uh, operate. And part of the taxi track was also used for vehicular traffic. And there, this, there was a stop sign. Again, stop sign. Absolutely not an aircraft because it was an experimental airbase. Nothing happening there. And now, this is how many years later? 58, 83, 84. That many years later, I'm a grown man now. I was driving the car because I was in my own private car. Again, I slowed down and I went past. And this Frenchman was like, sir, you didn't stop. I said, all right. There is nothing in there, no traffic lights, nothing. This only says stop. He said, but the sign said stop. And it is just to illustrate to us how we are so disrespectful as, as disregarding of what is required to be done. If this is the law, that is the law. Don't question it. If you think the law is wrong, change it. But do not violate it. And it's not only in civil life, even in the military I have seen this because you know you want to get things done. And many a time you find that the regulations that they have written, uh, as we have found that, as they say, you know, law is an ass. And it is an ass because many things, many times, it tells you to do something or not to do something which is, appears to be totally against common sense. Probably it had a a validity at the time that it was formed, may or may not be, but it doesn't have that validity right now. You cannot violate it. You have to change it. This is how civilized work works. And I will tell you this in the Western society. We talk in terms of, you know, they are as good as they are because of the technology, because of the scientific research. But I will tell you that, in fact, it is because of their lawmaking processes and because of their adherence to those laws. And if there is any disregard for those laws, then the consequences are severe. And I do believe that we have to get what you call as draconian measures. Draconian means not like Dracula, but draconian means harsh, stiff punishments. People don't stop when there's a stop sign, so what the hell do we do? We put speed barriers. And some of those barriers are absolutely neck breakers. In fact, there have been so many fatalities because those speed breakers are not marked not seen. People have gone over it and broken their necks. You have to insist on this is what is required to be done. You have to be much faster in doing this and you're always arguing and you're always abusing that policeman. What I want to tell you is you and I are at fault for not following that. He's doing something not for his sake but for yours and my sake. Let me tell you this, if you go and argue with any government employee in the Western world, not only a policeman, I'll come to that later, but even to a customs officer, when you're immigrating, you raise your voice or you question what he's doing. Let me tell you this, if you're not careful, you'll be put under arrest. Make no, make no mistake about that. Here we are always arguing with officials. But kyo? Many idhar jana hai. And let me tell you this. The people who are defying the law are not the uneducated and the less enlightened. I, as my wife would tell you, reasonably patient if traffic is heavy. If I have to slow down, 
but I am impatient when somebody in front of me, around me, infringes traffic regulations. And many a time I have stopped people and questioned why the hell are you doing this? Don't the uneducated, etc. And let me tell you, they tell me Haryanis, Haryanis are terrible. Any Haryanis around here? <laughs> they tell me that you know they are terribly uh, uncouth, if I may that use that word, in their behavior. But let me tell you this: not once. He says, "Sir, wrong." But I don't know what I'm telling you. But if I stop one of you, you means your counterparts. There are. There's an Institute of Technology Management just next to me. If I stop those guys and say, why are you parked like this, son? Why are you doing this? This is what we are doing. And unless you know, we stop the stresses within the society, and that is what is actually happening, that in our society, as I told you earlier, there are four factors. We are at different levels of, of civilization. If I may say this, you know, these heinous crimes that have been, been committed today, rapes, murders, the discussions are on TV amongst people like us. But the people who are committing, you know, this is not, let me tell you, this is not a, a thing which you talk about what is wrong and what is right, actually it is a social deficiency. That we are not sensitized people. We are not sensitized people of what their behavior should be. People have come from the villages. That, I mean, in Gurgaon, let me tell you this. There is so much of agricultural land. Now, I have been flying in the north for many, many years. And let me tell you this, each village, you know, there should be you know, lots of green space in between. Today, Gurgaon itself, or Gurugram, has eaten nearly a hundred villages, not more. And therefore, those people are at that level of civilization, as I call it, and we over here, we are not at the same frequency. And I would, uh, I hope I would not be accused of being politically incorrect, but you have to understand this, that there is, it is not Yes, there, there will be other people of the same strata doing those things. But there are people who actually don't know better. And they need, everything needs education. It's not only higher education and learning rocket science, but basics. Even your Safai Wala, he needs to be taught how to do your job. You need to give importance to him that you also matter. You see the difference between, we call Safai Wala, the Americans call them janitor. Look at the difference. He's a janitor. You know, janitor immediately you mean a man of consequence. See the way he's equipped. See the way he's trained. How well he cleans. You don't know it. I'm telling this, I, I'm talking, why am I talking to you as management students about this? Because management is in fact going down from the bottom to the top. Everything is management. Everything is management. And if you don't pay attention to detail, and this is what the military man does. If the commanding officer finds that some work is not done, he will of course catch the guy who is responsible for it. His superior in this. And if need be, he will do it himself. He will not find it below his dignity. Managing ourselves, nobody else is going to do it. You and I have to do it. We are prone to blame the politicians. So I tell the politician, I say, who are politicians? Politicians are you and I. We have elected them. They have come from nowhere else. They have not come from Mars. They have not come from Venus. They have come from exactly where we live. And many of them are today, let me tell you this, uh, without being political about it, we are so fortunate today in having a Prime Minister who I call is a superman. The stamina that he has, if you think you're working 18 hours here, let me tell you he's working 20 hours. He's working on 20 different issues. 
He's going here, he's going there. People say he's going on a foreign junket. He's not going in foreign junkets. He's going for a specific purpose. But for him to succeed, he needs people of caliber sitting over here. You have to show that the political direction that is given by him is implemented by you and all. Dr. Subramaniam told me that some of you, maybe your predecessors, maybe some of you are also inclined to do, that some of you have actually joined the services after this. Fantastic. I asked whether anybody is going to the civil services. I hope you do. But he says, of course, you know, the financial attraction is so much. Let me tell you, of course, financial attraction must always be there because that is what you're working for. But let me tell you in life, and I can tell you at the end of this life, that financial well-being may give you the capabilities of bringing many comforts and entertainments to you. But let me tell you this. The fights that you have when everything against you, and when you have achieved something against all odds, those are the things you'll remember best. When you go back from this institution, who are the guys who will talk about? Not the person who said, Acha bhai, aaj kya karna hai? Thakye? Thikye, baitho. Thikye, ab aram karo. Or the other person who come here and have the chabuk in his hand, get your work done. I don't care, you work 20 hours, it doesn't matter. You jolly well produce results. Five years later, ten years later, in your old age, you'll remember that guy. He is the one who showed that light to me. My wayward, wayward ways, he is the one who corrected. And there is so much on human resource development in these services. Today, by law, ragging is, is a crime. Even with the services. But the genesis of ragging is, is what the Americans call as boot camp. Today, everybody talks in terms of I don't know whether young people, because I'm told even young people go to these ashrams, you know, for rejuvenation. You know, you talk about detoxification. That you get all the poisonous substances out of your body, out of your mind, and start anew. Boot camp or ragging was exactly this. To do, detoxify you from your bad habits. Start anew fresh. Fresh page. And what they made you do to say that when a superior gives you an order, or when a superior just suggests do something, you do it without question. But the philosophy behind was, okay, if you're scared, somebody will tell you, okay, front roll down these steps. It is not just to have fun, but to overcome your fear. To say that when the going goes tough, I am tough enough to go on. If you didn't do it, he didn't kick you down the steps. He would demonstrate. Am I right, sir? You would demonstrate to show that to you that what he is asking you to do, he will do himself. Whereas we have talked in terms of it is asserting your authority, asserting your seniorship. It is not so. It is, in fact, one is to detoxify, as I said. The other is to build that bond. That bond, when you know that, okay, he made me from a boy, he converted me into a boy or a girl, into a man, to face life. He told me that things, life is not easy. And as some of the Bill Gates perhaps said, Life is not fair. It's just not fair. You may go to the temple, you may go to the Gurdwara, you may go to the church and pay ten times over. But take it from me. Of course, you'll say, no, there is a plan, there is an overall plan. 
but you just can't just say, I did this, I worked so hard, I don't get the prize, somebody else got the prize. That's it. You have to take it in your stride. We cannot ask for concession. I think that's something that all of us are aware of. These concessions were certainly required at one time to make sure that people with less economic strength or socially subjugated needed, you know, greater encouragement, opportunities to come out from where they were. And let me tell you, our society has changed hugely. A while ago, I talked about the American society and talked in terms of what is there between us. I covered some of the things. One of the greatest things that India, and we have surpassed America, is equal opportunity. Today, young people like you have shown what you can do when you're less privileged. Look at our Prime Minister. A Chaiwala. A Chaiwala heading the most, second most populous country and soon enough the most populous country in the world. Nothing to be ashamed of, something to be proud of. We have had a woman Prime Minister. We have had women presidents. We have had women speakers of assembly, of parliament. And today, let me tell you this, women are showing they are nothing less than you. In fact, let me tell you this, you know, an observation that your founder made. He says, we're finding today that women are actually doing better than boys. And I think there are several reasons for it. I'm not uh, sure whether I'm right, but let me just share what my views on this are. One of the things is that women have realized they have to prove themselves, and they are proving themselves. The other thing is, you know, that, that not, I would say, the actual capability, but a, a capability that has come out because of circumstance. They're multitaskers. Women can do four things and be ready for four more things. And a guy does one thing and he says, secondly, nay, sab mari ye kaam karne do pehle. It is reality. The amount of strength that a woman has to show you know, when economic strength of the family is not good enough, when requirements are greater than the income, it is the woman who manages this. Things are changing today. There is a greater awareness and, if I may say, enlightenment amongst us men. Did you realize that you need to share things with women, take their burden off them? There are people, of course, sometimes say, why have women getting greater advantages? I'm not too sure they get, they're, they're actually doing that. Because the disadvantage that they've had for circumstances. And that's the way civilizations have grown. And that is why I said that four strata of civilization, at the lowest moment, that woman is still being treated as she was probably done 10,000 years ago that is changing. Here, in the fourth wave, as I call it now, in fact, the economic strength that has come into women, there is a feeling of liberation and therefore you find that because you are not economically dependent, now again, during question hour, you can question me as you like, or shoot me down, I'll be happy to have that done. There is, is there a greater, or say, a greater reluctance to come to an understanding? These are social issues we need to talk up front, talk objectively, not passionately, emotionally. This is what education is all about. 
So this is what I talked in terms about coping with the present. There are a whole lot of other issues too, undoubtedly. But a few words just on talking in terms of how do we prepare for the future. We talk in terms of economy, future economy. Again, I come back to this futurologist, Alvin Toffler. He said, don't talk about economic future. Talk about the future of economy. And there is a vast difference between that. Meaning that one talks in terms of the present parameters of economy developing. Whereas economy of the future talks in terms of a totally changed paradigm. A paradigm that we have to set now to look ahead. India, you know when this uh, IT revolution came, IPOs came, suddenly found that we were into a lot of, you know, uh, posts available for filling up. And we found ourselves multinationals employing us here. Many of us going across to USA in particular, maybe some many other, other countries too. And the reason was essentially because they paid us less. And in fact, we branded that thing that, listen, we can give you cheaper labor, whether it is manual or it is intellectual. And Toffler said, if you continue with that philosophy, you're, all, you're a loser for the future. Because if you say that you, know, you will provide something cheaper, there'll be always somebody who will find a way to do it even cheaper. And then you talk in terms of having a protectionist. No, we will not allow this, we will not allow that. And you cannot grow. And he talked in terms of that, you know, when China started doing this mass production at very cheap rates, the smart guy, the guys who are actually fourth level now, they use knowledge. They used what is required, and therefore you started doing digital shoes. You know, shoes which were, uh, which, which are being sold so cheap. Korea, South Korea, did this all digitally, and therefore online, you just gave you know, okay, these are the measurements you want. This is what it is. Three days later, you had the shoe as you want, fitting, best quality, cheaper. You have to find different solutions. You cannot think in terms of what is required today. You know, there was a time when only engineers, engineers, construction engineers, uh, civil engineers. Then came a time for electrical engineers, no, electronic engineers, IT. But these are all transitory. Some way or the other, you'll always find that the glut goes off because something else has happened. And therefore, we have to talk in terms of what is the future and think in terms of how it will be. While you are professionally getting an expertise in a specific discipline, you need to take interest in other spheres too. See what is happening. Multiscaling, which ladies do, learn that. Everything, every knowledge that you possibly can get, acquire it. You never know when it will come in handy. Knowledge is never wasted. Acquire it. Nothing is below you. Today, it's no point just talking in terms of IT. We have to talk in terms of what is happening outside. I don't know how many of you are aware of what is an exoplanet is. Do you know what an exoplanet is? No, no, come on. They will have to be at least, I thought the whole hand will... Exoplanet? Anybody? What's an exoplanet? 
I am, let me tell you this, this is what I am saying, we are not at that fourth level. Exoplanet is a planet which is outside the solar system. There are stars other than the sun that we have. There are billions and billions and billions of them. In fact, there are billions of galaxies. I don't know what, if you know what a galaxy is. And today we are finding that there are not only planets outside, but with the technology that is developed, we are finding that there are planets within what is known as habitable zone. As you know, there are eight planets, there at one time nine, now we said no, we downgraded one and say no, that's not a planet, Pluto is no more a planet, because of the, it doesn't meet the criteria of planet. But only Earth, only Earth has all the given requisites for creating and sustaining life. Today, the vanguard countries, pioneers, are looking into the future because as you know, the earth can vanish any day. I'm not, this is not a doomsday philosophy or a doomsday prediction. But there are 10,000 ways in which earth itself can end here or if not the earth, you know, because of climate change, the earth will stay, we won't be there. And as you know, today there, there is this thinking because of uh, that Mars itself had water at one time. It had atmosphere, life-sustaining conditions, but for various whatever the reasons are, it vanished. And if you are not careful about how to protect this, and this is what is futurology, looking to the future, and looking at this exoplanet is just not, you know, serving your fantasies, what is happening. It is preparing for a future that may or may not be there, but preparing for it. It doesn't come to you as a future shock, as what Toffler's first book said in the 1960s. And I'm saying this, all this, because unless you read beyond your immediate professional interests, you will not grow. You will not be a pioneer. I don't know how did you know, you, none of you can tell me what an exoplanet is. At least I expect 50% of you at least should tell me what the Milky Way is. <laughs> Which galaxy? <laughs> Great, okay. You guys are still awake. I'm, I'm glad that I have not put you to sleep. If you are going to sleep, it's my fault entirely. How many of you have seen the Milky Way? Sorry? Let me tell you this, the last time I saw the Milky Way, 20 years ago, when I was AOCJNK, because the sky was clear, Molina and I used to sit in a little lawn and look upstairs, and there was the sky, beautiful starry skies. And the Milky Way, what a beautiful band it is. I, I won't be, you know, I won't be surprised at all if none of you have seen it. Because the urban conditions, even the rural conditions in India do not allow you to do it. Unless, you know, not even Kashmir Valley, Ladakh. You go to America, see the purity of that air. I'm saying this because sitting there, if you lie down and look up and see that stars and wonder what the hell is this all about. In my lifetime, let me tell you this, how our knowledge has increased. Of course, as you know, during the time of Copernicus, you know, they said, you know, the church said that Earth is the center of the universe. And soon we realized, in fact, it is not. Then we thought the sun is the center of the universe. Then we thought our galaxy is the only galaxy. But today I've realized that there are not only in our galaxy alone, there are over 100 billion stars. In each of these stars, at least in 50% of the stars, there are planets. And I'm sure in some of those planets, there will be conditions for sustaining life. Of course, there are many, 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 I mean, 
the nearest star to us. Do you know what is the nearest star to us and how far it is? Anybody knows? I can't. Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is our nearest star to us and it is four light years away. You know what a light year is away? What, what does a light year mean? It is the time taken for light to travel. That means four years it will take for light to travel from our solar system to that star. Now can you imagine, even if you travel at unimaginable speed of one, one tenth the speed of light, it is next to impossible with our present technology. One tenth, ten times more, that means 40 years just to the nearest star. 40 years there, 40 years, so in, including your communication, you send a message now, that of course will go four years and eight years later you'd have it back over here. But people are thinking in terms that in one day, the starships, and you know what you talk in terms of Star Trek, they're not entirely science fiction, actually it is looking into the future. People are talking in terms of finding, now if not our planets, on the satellites of our planets. And therefore just don't be satisfied with what you're doing today. And I say this, because you're not taking care of only yourself. You're taking care of your children who are not yet born, their children and their children. Today my life has come to an end. Merely it was an end. But how much? Four-fifths gone? <laughs> it's not the... But, and let me tell you this. You know, when we got independence, our lifespan was 29 years, average lifespan. Today, it is nearing 70 years. There are many people who are living like 90 years. But I am, what I am telling you about this, today I worry about for my grandson. What is the earth that will inherit? Will it continue to be a rat race here? And today in India, we are living for today. We have to live for the future, the future of mankind. And then all this, the last part, as a multi, I think, but you gave me less time than you gave me, yeah? Okay. The last thing I want to tell you. In all this, I talked about the requirement for civil, uh, civic stability. And the last thing is security. I've come to this because it is the most important thing, the security of the nation. If you are not secure, if you let your guard down, we have been occupied by, I don't know how many civilizations, people have come, occupied here, gone back, looted us, they will come back again. Technologically you have to be ahead, but the vanguard for ensuring that the present is safe is the military. So overall what I've talked about is that we need to be, my wife is now telling me, hey listen guy, get moving. And I understand her, her anxiety. If you will permit me, two minutes more. I talked, absolutely, you can time me now. I talked in terms of, you know, reading things outside your, but I talked in terms of technical things. It is important that you read classics. You read books about human nature and human strength. I think I have it. I normally carry. Okay. I've been carrying this for the last six years, not this piece of paper, but what is written on it. And it has sustained me. In different times of turmoil, personal challenges to say what, who I am. Maybe some of you have read it and it's a poem by Rudyard Kipling. If. I will read it slowly just to give you what you could aspire for. I should have known this by heart but senility, senility has grown in so I need to read this. If you can keep your head, 
when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for the doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. If being hated, don't give way to hating. And yet, don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not let dreams become your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat both these impostors just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth that you have spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch things that you gave your life to, broken, stoop, and build them up again with broken tools. If you can make a heap of all the things that you've achieved and all your winnings and risk it on just one turn of toss and lose and start again at the very beginning and never breathe a word about your losses. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone. I hope you understand this. You are disabled like I am now, heart gone, mind gone, muscle gone, but the will will still remain. To serve your turn, <laughs> and so hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on. If you can talk with crowds and keep your virtue, or walk with things, yet not lose your common touch. If neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, if all men count, but none too much. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60, 60 seconds of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. And if I may add as a last line, as a husband, as a father of three daughters and one granddaughter, and which says, you will be a man, my son, or a woman of worth more than a son. Thank you. I apologize to all of you for making your evening longer than I intended to. If you have benefited, nice. Thank you ever so much for your patience. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I, Abhay Sharma, student manager, Sri Balaji Society, is honored to extend vote of thanks to our eminent guest today, Air Chief Marshal, Anil Yashwan Tipni, sir. Sir, we are really thankful for enlightening us with the precious mantras like management basics in army as well as educational societies. You focused on enhancing attitude of today's youth as well as us transformation of managing ourselves effectively. Civilization aspects, security of nation importantly. Sir, we are overwhelmed with your esteemed presence, as we will definitely inculcate appropriate code of conduct norms in a behavior set by you for sure. Your bravery, courageous attitude, inspiring personality motivated us a lot. Sir, you guided us to read Masterpiece book to enhance our knowledge and confidence. We are enlightened with gracious presence of Mrs. Molinia Tipnis, ma'am. I would like to extend my heartiest thanks to Major Arun Pathak, sir, and Mrs. Pathak, ma'am, to make this evening great with the esteemed presence. 
we would be privileged to have many more such sessions to be organized in near future. Finally, concluding my vote of thanks, I would like to submit my sincere thanks to our beloved Bala sir and Brigadier M.L. Bambani sir who made this life-changing event a possibility for us. Thank you.